Now, our first step into this new and hopeful way of seeing will come at the invitation of Dr. Prajat Singh, a physician whose title is the physician of the thing called population. He is a physician of population health. He is a gift of Kenya, a gift of the Sikh tradition. With eyes a little bit on the younger side, eyes with mature curiosity about what the community itself has to work with. An extraordinary mind, a graceful author of a powerful recent book, Dying and Living in the Neighborhood. He is our perfect guide into this open space, into this sacred space called Shaw, and the sacred curiosity about the sacred thing called population. Dr. Singh, please. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Gunderson. What a, what a joy, what a joy to be here with you all today. Thank you, uh, President Dillard and Dean Hill for your introduction and your context setting this morning. And to Professor Gunderson's point about young eyes, I just want to mention that it is a real joy, it's an honor, and it is, I think, important for us to, to also recognize, and myself as well, that a younger generation is being encouraged to also walk into a, a complex discussion. And I'm doing so in the presence of people that I really admire, uh, people whose work in practice, in faith, and in science uh, I've looked up to and I look to for guidance. And so it's with that spirit that I would like to share with you an invitation um, about how I've come to understand this arena of work uh, through sometimes unexpected pathways. I feel, I feel blessed to be in this space with you today um, and have the opportunity to invite you not to conclude but to open with that holy curiosity that was mentioned about what is the right conversation about population health and faith-based assets. We heard it so beautifully this morning, but I was so taken by the history of Shaw University that I wanted to read a little bit more about it before coming here. As Dean Dillard mentioned, Shaw University hosted the first four-year medical school to train African-American doctors in the South, and it was the first medical school to have a four-year curriculum. In its 40 years, it trained 400 doctors. One of them was Clinton Caldwell Boone. He graduated here in 1910, and he felt compelled after working here, after graduating from here, to go work in Congo and Liberia. That's, of course, I feel connection to, I grew up in Kenya and I've worked across Sub-Saharan Africa extensively in my work. And he established, when he was there in uh, Monrovia, Liberia, the first church in the New Republic of Liberia. And he helped bring high-quality care to a nation that was formed by freed slaves. When he saw the only dentist in Liberia die from the flu, he decided that he needed to actually come back to New York City and be trained to be a dentist as well. What, what force connects us to such distant places that calls and compels us to act on the behalf of a new nation's population? Clinton Caldwell Boone built a congregation in Liberia, and it is no coincidence that that congregation formed the basis, social basis for his medical work. Amidst the hardship of forging a new republic in a complicated geography with its own challenges, he needed to have a base of social support, a means to organize the community, and to begin the hard work of building institutions that could serve it in visible and material ways. This is a human story, and this story could have taken place at nearly any corner of the world, at any time in history with any set of people, all of whom who face their human condition and realize that they need to look beyond for the strength to move onwards. Somehow, people find the spirit to organize, to act, and to build a better future. Professor Gunderson 
who I've had the fortune of reading prior to speaking, calls this human activity collectively communities of spirit. Communities of spirit are the, is the intangible, as he says, the intangible and powerful field of human energy that drives voluntary associations across the population and in service of it. I think by elevating that idea of communities of spirit, I think we can all find ourselves, however we enter this discussion, as part of it. It is no surprise that amongst the first acts of communities of spirit is to organize and build public health and healthcare institutions. Together, they bring the core values of justice and compassion, along with scientific rigor, to improve that population health. I'm reminded, and again, so privileged and honored to be here in the presence of uh, Dr. John Hatch, who has taken this concept, who has intuitively understood it and has built a, a movement for our nation to have community health centers across this country that now serve you know, nearly 40 million people. It's extraordinary to be here with somebody that understands that intuitively and has helped for, build very materially and visibly healthcare for our nation. Much of the foundational work for the faith-based health assets, as we heard this morning from Professor Gunderson, was carried out for the World Health Organization from the University of Cape Town with Dr. James Cochran here with us again. So again, I'm privileged to be here speaking to, in fact, the experts, the leaders, and the practitioners. And he surveyed countries across Africa to better understand how faith and health institutions productively align to serve people. And in the process, that group began to unravel the tangible and intangible dynamism that becomes visible when we consider the role of faith, health, collaborations, and improving population health. My understanding of these relationships has been unexpected. I did a PhD in basic science, and then I did further study in economics, all while I trained as a physician in the gleaming medical towers of New York City's medical institutions. My thoughts were focused inwards, if I could speak honestly, about deciphering diagnoses and solving problems, not always thinking about people. In my first year of residency, I took care of a patient whom I'll, I'll call Ray. Within days of my caring for him, he died. Because I lived in the same neighborhood as him in Harlem, I ran into his daughter on the street, who unexpectedly invited me to a funeral at his church. And I'll share a brief passage of what I later wrote about recalling his funeral. And I want you to think about this in the context of where you're sitting here today because it's this very similar to the context that I was sitting in on that day. As I listened to the Ray's eulogy along with his family members, I could feel the thick social structure of the community. The wooden pews held Ray's fellow veterans in uniform and his grandchildren all dressed in dark blue. There were clusters of generations leaning on canes or hunched over smartphones. One of his nieces started talking to me and told me that he never learned how to read and something I did not know when I gave him written instructions. I paid my respects to the well-dressed man in the coffin. I recognized him from his exposed ankles, located between the short tan socks and neatly pressed beige dress pants, where his skin was darkened and wrinkled from years of blood pooling in his legs. I had seen his exposed chest prior to being transferred to the ICU, and now I saw a cream-colored silk tie rest upon a dark brown vest with an unwound pocket watch frozen at 10 past two. I realized I did not really know anything about him or his life. In the hospital, this fact did not seem important. In front of him now, it felt disrespectful. If the healthcare system and neighborhood both care about his well, well-being, why are they so evidently disconnected? Before I left the funeral, I walked to speak to his pastor about his perspective on the health of the, his congregation. As I waited, I wondered for the first time how anyone who could not read manages multiple medical conditions. How many times had I scribbled a phone number or for a referral or handed out information pamphlet to a patient assuming they could read it without checking to make sure? For the 32 million adult Americans who are illiterate and many more who don't fully understand their conditions, staying on a healthy path is impossible without being able to read the sound signposts along the way and the medical institutions around us are not the only ones that give those signposts. 
When the pastor arrived, he gently explained how part of his job is to support his congregation when he senses trouble. He's worried about obesity in kids and how to counsel young couples when a spouse needs to start dialysis. He explained that his congregation does not always make the distinctions between spiritual support and clinical decision making, and he had to manage it all. This is a passage from the book that Professor Gunderson mentioned, Dying and Living in the Neighborhood. I was motivated to write about this years after I met this patient because, of my, because my own relationship with the neighborhood where I lived, Harlem, changed significantly in 2013. In 2013, I was walking in my neighborhood at dusk when I was attacked by about 20 to 30 men who called me a terrorist. As a visible member of the Sikh faith tradition, I was no stranger to how hateful rhetoric has real consequences. My jaw was fractured, but I felt gratitude that my wife and my child were not with me when that happened. As I shared my sentiments with local media, I was unprepared for the national and local groundswell of letters, of thousands of letters and emails that expressed sorrow for what had happened and affirmation for who I am. As a physician who was supposed to take care of a community, I felt very powerfully a community taking care of me. I saw firsthand how connected we are as a nation and how invisible bonds that connect us can be made visible. As a result, I traveled across the country to learn more about these connections. In Minneapolis, I learned how a faith-based congregation, uh, organization, Isaiah, had used a health impact assessment to change transportation policy. In Dallas, I learned how, on the research side, the Parkland Health Center worked with many faith-based organizations to develop shared technologies that supported their most vulnerable clients. What I saw inspired me, and I learned that there are movements of people across the country that are thinking about these collaborations at very large scale. I'm going to draw a little bit from Professor Gunderson's writing when I give you some context for this scale. It is important to note that uh, <clears throat> here in the U.S., there's approximately 350,000 social entities called congregations. In the U.S., faith identities are diverse, including ones that do not identify as formal religions. To put this number in context, there are about 250,000 neighborhoods or geographic communities in America, depending on how you count them. As a result, these faith-based assets, these collaborations form a connective tissue of social infrastructure that supports, connects, and protects, and helps us better understand our neighborhoods. They are an important, they are an important, they are in an important position to be organized partners in health. At a time when public health and healthcare institutions are both trying to work more concertedly, to improve population health, they're finding common ground in neighborhoods. In this context, the science of population health is identifying how clinical and non-clinical factors shape the health of people. This increasingly includes an emphasis on the social context of people's lives, whether people have social or caregiver support, whether the cost of care will cause financial distress or bankruptcy, and whether there is a meal on the table to accompany medications or if there will be a safe and trusted place to live, sleep at the end of a day every day. Although the science of population health can identify these social factors, public health and healthcare institutions cannot address them alone. Life expectancy in America has stagnated for the first time in decades, and the costs of care are causing real distress and damage in people's lives. And the moral voice of our allied health professions is difficult to hear, as so many people in our rich country live in poverty and justice, injustice grows. We need help and we need to understand how communities of spirit in America and across the world influence and can better uh, yield population health. It is important to note that the relationship between population health and faith institutions has not always been positive, as was mentioned earlier. In fact, the methods and conclusions of each can be used intentionally or not to disrespect each other. People's lives live in this balance. We must keep our eyes open to this history and we must also be intentional about why we're inviting a dialogue about building the right relationships between population health and faith-based assets. In the process, we will recognize that the wisdom of faith and the methods of science are each part of a shared human desire 
and capacity to reach beyond our current challenges and into a better future. So three things that I'd like us to consider together today. First, we must better understand the nature of the social connective tissue that faith-based athletes have with their populations, not only within their congregations, but also across other non-faith-based organizations and institutions in their communities. The American political scientist Robert Putnam and his colleagues in political science, sociology, psychology, and related fields have documented how our social fabric influences our ability to survive and thrive and how faith communities play an important role in our health in measurable and well-described ways. Of course, new social technologies allow us to learn about relationships and how communities form at unprecedented scale. So health institutions must chart a research agenda that embraces new questions, new partnerships, and new methods. Secondly, we must put our growing understanding to work in practical ways. Faith health partnerships across the nation have worked to advocate for missing social investments in children, to dismantle racist housing policies in neighborhoods, to protect undocumented Americans and recent immigrants from danger, and to wrap around isolated and lonely seniors. This is complicated and important work, and it needs to happen every day with greater support. Third, we must work with faith leaders to ensure that important public health messages and healthcare recommendations are richer in Professor Gunderson's words, and more relevant to communities of spirit. For example, the polio eradication campaigns that I saw firsthand worldwide required deep partnerships with faith leaders to reach that last mile. They needed partners to get that done. Today, rumors about health spread faster than the evidence, and con congregational leaders must be seen as trusted partners in population health. And this is joint work with a shared aim. So today, today we will hear practical, tangible examples of important partnerships forming between faith communities and health institutions, as well as the role of policymakers who are forging a new dialogue while respecting the relationship between faith and government. This is a day of learning, listening, and foremost, it's a day of leadership. I invite each of you to take practical insights from the day back to your respective communities. I invite each of you to identify what research is needed to better understand these relationships and build better collaborations. And finally, I invite each of you to share why you're here personally and professionally in this vital topic with the friends and colleagues that you'll meet throughout the day. So thank you all for listening, and I, and I warmly welcome each other, all of us together, to the day ahead. Thank you.